Uh, as you know, I'm a health consultant, and uh, I talked with a client that I've worked with for 23 years, Regional West Medical Center out of Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Anybody know where that's at? Nope. Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. That's like asking somebody if they know what Iowa is. I think it's the capital of some state, right? And so forth. They have a population of about 17,000. It's a combination of two towns, Scotts Bluff and Gilling. They have a 197-bed acute care hospital there. They had, now remember, we got a population around 17,000, right? Okay, over 1,000 cases in one day. Uh, about a third of the uh, employees at the hospital have the COVID and so forth. They're in a nightmare over there, a mess, uh, and so forth. But we're seeing that in Michigan. We're seeing it in North Dakota, South Dakota, New York, uh, and so forth. It's, it, it is flu season, right? So COVID is reintroducing itself and so forth. So uh, we hear all kinds of things that are going to be happening. What? It sounds like somebody's making popcorn, uh, which is good. Uh, but uh, anyway, I uh, did want to give you the bad news. It is some good news uh, and so forth. Hope everybody got a flu shot. Uh-oh. We'll put you down on the list, Robert. <laughs> so forth. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to talk about worship this morning, uh, worship and education. And uh, it's an interesting study um, when you talk about worship. And uh, I did a little in-depth study with regard to some various commentaries and so forth to try to get an idea what worship is. So I thought this morning we might start, well, with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into a question. Let's bow our heads. Well, Father, we give thanks again that we can be here this morning. We're glad that we can study your word. We're glad that we can come to the throne of grace. Uh, what a privilege that is. And we pray this morning as we study this very important subject of worship that you'll give us insight into the power of your Holy Spirit, a knowledge that will help us to understand how to worship you. And so we ask these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, being a consultant, one of the things we do all the time is to survey people. You notice I didn't mention poll. I didn't say the word poll, because that apparently isn't all of that effective, uh, and so forth. So we survey people, and we do that to try to get an idea, in essence, about what people think about certain things. And it's from a commercial perspective of trying to develop business for hospitals who basically need other forms of income or revenue besides inpatients and outpatients. So we introduce them to the commercial marketplace. So we have to do surveys to determine what is the market like. We call that a market assessment and so forth. So today, I want to just uh, throw this out at you and say when you hear the word worship, what, was the, what goes through your mind? Be nice to know if we could just survey people and say, worship. Don't think about it. Just what comes into your mind when you hear that, that term? Church. All right, church. Now, if you go to a Sunday church, you go to a Sabbath church, it doesn't make really any difference because you, you look at the thing here, we got Sunday school or Sabbath school starts at 1030 or 10 o'clock. Then what does it say? The worship service starts at 11 or 11.30. So you get the idea that Sabbath school is not a worship service. Right? And so the only worship service is the primary time, and between 11 o'clock and 12 when the pastor speaks, we have group singing, etc., etc. And so is that what worship is? Yeah, Bob. Okay, he mentioned the term adoration. If you go to Webster's Dictionary and you look up worship, it talks about adoration, right? Awe, those type of things, and so forth. But Bob said something else. Uh, he, Bob kind of indicates that it goes beyond a meeting. Is that right? Okay, that there's, it goes beyond the way we categorize it. And we categorize it because <laughs> that's the way, if you look in Christian circles or any other circle, that's the way they categorize it, as an event. 
Worship so there's an event. Now, the three angels' message, I bet all of us could go right down and tell exactly what it talks about. But there's one thing it starts off with, the three angels' message. Do something with God, right? Worship God. And the reason it gives us to worship God is because he is our creator. Isn't that right? And so forth. So, let's take a look at a couple of things. Okay. This is a statement from Baker's Evangelical Dictionary. I love this. I enjoy using it and so forth. Let's give you their definition of worship. It says this, if Christianity is the transformation of rebels into worshipers of God, then it is imperative for the Christian to know and understand what constitutes biblical worship, a theme today. Okay. One may always consult Webster's Dictionary for the precise meaning of worship. Adore, idolize, esteem worthy, reverence, homage, all of those terms that we've used but I want you to look at this especially. I've highlighted in yellow there. Yet truly defining worship proves more difficult because it is both an attitude and an act. Anybody agree with that? Worship is an attitude and an act. What do you think comes first? Attitude. Okay. So attitude. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, we'll have to ponder that one, all right, a little bit, because we're going to come to that. That's, that's a good point, all right? That's why I love Sabbath school. We get all kinds of things and so forth. Uh, but anyway, have you ever heard anybody say to you, oh, you know, Bob, he's got an attitude. Is that a proactive statement? <laughs> I got a yes over here. That is a pro. <laughs> he's got, it could be, I guess. Now, what do you think? When somebody says, Janet's got an attitude issue. What are they saying? Yeah, that's an ambiguous statement. <laughs> you don't help at all, Bob, I want to tell you, right? Now. <laughs> okay. All right, so Bob says it's ambiguous, okay? So we have no clue. <laughs> and so forth. What do you think of when you hear someone has an attitude? Okay. It's not a proactive statement. It's not a positive yeah, okay. I mean, you don't normally, there's a difference, so maybe there are times that it is. So I had a gal many years ago, she worked for Re Regional West, which is a company I consulted for for 23 years. And she was working out of Omaha. She was a phlebotomist. Everybody know what a phlebotomist is, okay? And so uh, she was scheduled to be at work at 8 o'clock. And she worked in a doctor's office because in this particular situation, the hospital placed a phlebotomist, which was a hospital employee, in this physician's office because it was a multi-specialist group and it made sense to have that phlebotomist right there so the patients didn't have to go to a patient service center or whatever. But if the problem was that 8 o'clock was the starting time and she didn't get there until 8.30. So we had to approach her and said, look, uh, I think we went over this, that you're supposed to be here at 8. And she said, ah, I've done this for years. 8.30 should work. 8.30 should work, and so forth. Now, her thought that 8.30 should work did what to her action? She performed what she was thinking, right? So attitude in worship leads us to our actions in worship. Would you agree? Okay. All right, so we've got a little semblance of order here, basically that how we approach something mentally in our heart is an indication of how we are going to act. And we're gonna really get into that a little bit later because Jesus addressed that. All right, whoops, okay. Now, this uh, is from the same uh, Baker's Evangelical. It says this. The antidote, antidote to that problem recommended in his discourse with the Samaritan woman remains the best preventive against false worship. Now, you know the story of the Samaritan woman. 
Jesus comes up to him and he says, uh, look, uh, I could sure use a drink. And what does she say? Why would a Jew ask a Samaritan for something to drink? Because the scripture says, Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with one another, right? Period. And so forth. And so Jesus goes through the discussion with her. I can give you water that you'll never have to drink. You'll never thirst again, right? And she says, and she says go, uh, go get your husband. She says, well, I have no husband. He said, you speak correctly. You had four husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Isn't that right? And then she goes on and says something else about, well, you Jews, she changes the subject. And she says, well, you Jews worship in Jerusalem, and we worship in Samaria. What was she saying about her religion, about her faith? What was her testimony about? What was her faith to her? Think about just that statement. What is she saying? Where you worship makes a difference in your faith. Uh-oh, that could be loaded, couldn't it? Don't we sometimes talk about, as we've said before, that worship is not just a meeting, right? Worship doesn't, whether it's here, whether it's there, whether it's in Thailand, whether it's out in, you know, uh, out taking a hike, and so that's all could be a worship experience, right? And so forth. We'll clarify that a little more. Now let's go and let's look at this again. Ah, too much for technology. There we go. She says this, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Okay, here's the key to worship. The, the, uh, now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. So worship to be appropriate has to be in the spirit and in truth. So we'll come back to that. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, would you agree with me, if I made this statement, let's make a statement. If you're not worshiping in the spirit and the truth, your worship is of no avail. True or false? How many agree with that statement? How many don't? You don't. You do. Okay. Well, a little light on the gun here. <laughs> I thought you got a good night's rest, Mark. You told me you did, right? <laughs> oh, that's ambiguous. <laughs> well, he's right in a certain degree. I mean, I've read that before, you know, over time. I remember when I first probably early days read that and said, what does that mean? Worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, and so forth. So we're going to determine that here in just a minute. So we need to find out what that term means if we want to worship properly, right? So let's go here. This is from Adam Clark's commentary. Anybody have Adam Clark's commentary? That's an old commentary. It's been around a while. It is very, very good. Ellen White had it in her library, as a matter of fact, and used it quite a bit. I love it. And uh, let's see why. It's going to address what we just talked about. So let's go with it. As all creatures were made by him, so all owe him obedience and reverence. But to be acceptable to this infinite spirit, the worship must be a, of a spiritual nature. It must spring from the heart through the influence of the Holy Spirit. All right. So to worship in the spirit means you are guided by the Holy Spirit. You're motivated by the Holy Spirit, all right? You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Now, let's go back to our initial conversion experience. What is one of the gifts that you receive when you are converted? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember Peter in chapter 2, in the day of Pentecost, and he was telling them, and we've covered this before, and he was telling them about all the things that the Jewish nation had done even crucified the Messiah. And the people were, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
once you are converted, once you have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, you are guaranteed the Holy Spirit. You are now in a position to worship in the Spirit. Do you agree with that? That is correct. Legally, you are saved. Okay? As far as you being righteous, uh, that's another subject. But you are legally declared righteous because Jesus looks at his own life and not yours. That's the way the judgment will be. Isn't that wonderful news? When you step in front of the judgment, your attorney will be Jesus. He'll also be your judge, the Bible says. And that's a kind of a nice combination, isn't it? How would you like to have your personal attorney be your judge as well? I mean, doesn't that seem like it's kind of tilted? <laughs> and since I am the defendant, I'm happy about it, right? And so should you. So going back to Bob's situation is, okay, since I am a converted Christian, and a conversion is a daily thing. It's a constant coming to Jesus, right? We need him all the time, every time, and every moment. Wouldn't you agree? So, in essence, the first part of that is that I've accepted Jesus. I now have the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't feel it. I don't smell it. I don't touch it. I can't hear it, but it's there for me to use. Okay? So now I'm in. I got one of them right. Now we still have another. We need to worship in truth as well. Let's finish this real quick. It is what it says. And it must be in truth, not only in sincerity, but according to divine revelation. Is it good enough to be sincere in our faith? Or is there much more to it than that? How many people who worship false gods? How many people who think they're doing the right thing but are not, or are worshiping sincerely, right? It's not good enough. All right, so let's go on. But performed according to divine revelation which has been given men of himself. Now look at this last part. A man worships God in spirit. Then under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he brings in all his affections, all his appetites, all his desires to the throne of God, and he worships him in truth when every purpose and passion of his heart and when every act of his religious worship is guided and regulated by what? The Word of God. So, to worship in truth and spirit is, first of all, I need to be converted. I cannot have the Holy Spirit unless Jesus gives it to me. And if I don't have the Holy Spirit and try to worship him, we're going to find out the repercussions of that, to worship God without the Holy Spirit. People do. People do. The Pharisees did. Had no Holy Spirit. Okay. And then, what guides us into knowing how to worship God the Holy Spirit guides us to the Scriptures and helps us to understand its meaning. Everybody with me on that? Everybody agree with that? Any comment on that? Okay? All right. Now, this is something I found in a Christian magazine. There is no author to this, and the more I read it, I thought, whoa, this is a great statement. All right, let's take a look at it. Let's see if you agree with this. Worship is a lifestyle. Now let's stop there for a moment. If someone were to say to you, worship is a lifestyle, what would that mean to you? What is a lifestyle? Part of who you are. Part of who you are? And uh, in essence, how is that, what can I say, enacted in a person's life? Whoa! There it is, right? We are worshiping every second of every day. Worship is a lifestyle. It is not a church. It is not a particular activity. It's none of those. And Jesus said you have two pieces. What are the two pieces? Two pieces that you need to worship effectively. We don't, if we don't do anything else today, we'll get this. To worship in spirit, what does that mean? That we have the Holy Spirit on our heart. Why do we have the Holy Spirit on our Because I'm converted. Jesus gave it to me. Isn't that neat? We always think of the gifts that Jesus gives. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we were allowed to believe in Santa Claus until we know of 
we caught Dad out by the tree. Uh, then that was out, right? And so forth. But we got one gift. And, you know, my folks were far from wealthy, but we were not that poor. We lived a very simple life. We lived out in the country in Iowa. And uh, we get the one gift. And we didn't expect any more. We were happy with that. Okay, unless you got something you didn't want, and then you really had no options, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And so, good morning, man. Why don't we help you? And so, anyway, Jesus, when we come to him, gives us a multitude of gifts. Isn't that right? He gives us forgiveness. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gives us repentance. These are all gifts that come at conversion. How can any man boast, right? But we can boast in him, right? Okay. So, let's look at this. Worship is a lifestyle. According to this, let's go on. Response to God, not just something done through music at church. Worship includes daily loving God according to his teachers, teachings found where? In Scripture. All right? As well as with heart and emotions focused on him. Second, worship includes both a personal and a communal aspect. Anybody want to get into that a little bit? It's both personal and it's communal. Today we're doing a communal act of worship. Wouldn't you agree? You'll do that on the 11 o'clock service and so forth. But when Dan goes outside and he is talking to people, everything he says, every way he acts is a form of worship toward God. Now, we've never looked at it like that. We've really broadened the scope of worship. It is a lifestyle. It is who we are. Okay? And the more we come to Jesus, the more we will reflect his character. For some of us, it takes a little longer than a few days, uh, and so forth. But anyway, Mark, you had a point. Yeah. Um, we, we, through corporate worship, we, we hone in and kind of refine each other. Okay. Now, the fear has been because of the COVID virus, and I know the conference feels this way, and I think anybody would, is that people start getting used to staying home on Sabbath. And then all of a sudden, it's okay to come back. The fear is... How many will we lose? They've got comfortable being home. Who says you can't worship at home? You can. Because worship involves more than being here. But did, what did Jesus say? What did Paul say about that? Do not forsake the meeting together, and especially as we get near and near to the end. We need one another. Based upon the COVID-19 experience, how can we support? Doesn't that support that? How do you think people feel right now? After, since March, since this thing had, what effect has it had on your disposition? I have to admit, there have been times I've been depressed. It's had that effect on me. Okay, I don't like being shut in. I want to be out with social beings. I want to communicate with others. I want to enjoy their company. Isn't that right? The church is a, is a group of people who need to socialize. They need to be together. And especially the times get tougher. We need one another. And so forth. So, personal and communal worship is important. But we're going to even take it a little further. Because as we study the religious, I'm going to call them Christians, although they were Jewish, but we'll call them Christian. Something was wrong with their worship. And that's why when we talk about the three angels' message, the first theme that it talks about is worship. Right? It's not about the beast, not about his mark or anything else. That comes later. But it's about worship. Because we do not understand, and I include myself in here, we do not understand what worship really is. And if we have a false understanding of it, it will lead to what Jesus ran into 
when he came into his, uh, this world the first time. Okay? So, uh, any other comment on that? I know it's hard to comment when we're spread all over the world, right? And so forth. So if you've got a comment and you say, you know what, I need to be heard. Well, just pretend you're in the House of Representatives and you just let it out, right? <laughs> so just do it that way. Okay. That's right. Okay, let's follow up on that, Bob. Well, he did say it was difficult, but he also said, my burden is easy, and my burden is light. And I think what he was talking about is the fact, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we continue to walk in that valley, but what, else, what happens for a Christian? Worldly people walk through it too. Give you a peace, but he says, I will walk it with you. I'm not going to take you out of it, but I'm going to walk with you. And we know that, uh, whether it be a friend, a spouse, or whatever, when we go through difficulty, working it and going through it together. When the church goes through it together, it helps us all. It helps give us confidence and courage. And we all need that. Sometimes we probably come to church with our attitude is such that I'm just so down. I'm so discouraged. I might have a work problem. I might have a marriage issue. I might have whatever it is and so forth, he made the right decision of coming to church with fellow believers. I'm going to give you a story, and I'm hesitated about giving this. So please pardon me and forgive me if I've taken this a little too far. I was the first elder at a church in Paris, California. It was a good-sized church, and we had a potluck. A woman came, uh, never seen her before. She didn't come with anybody, and she had two little children. She went to the table where the food was, and she put a big pan of fried chicken right in the middle. And uh, one of our elders came over to her, took her aside, and he said this. We don't eat chicken in this church, and you shouldn't have brought it. And she, I, I, mean, I, I was close enough where I could hear what he was saying. Her face turned about nine shades of red. And she said, I I'm sorry, I, I, di I didn't know. He said, next time you come, you bring what's appropriate. We are vegetarian here. And so forth. She never came back. I want to tell you something. I was so angry. The red on my neck started to cease all the way up. You know, when Jesus said, you know what? Tithing's a good thing, but there's something more important. Love, goodness, and kindness. This woman may never come back to our church, and should she? When we talk about worship today, Jesus was more concerned. You remember he talked about David eating the showbread. Remember that? David's running from Saul. You know the Bible tells about eating showbread in the temple? It's not good. You shouldn't be doing it. That's God's command. But when Jesus was accused of picking corn on the Sabbath, he said, don't you remember the story of David? He's talking about the same story of the woman who brought the fried chicken. There's something about goodness to others and tenderness with people that's more important than your rules and your regulations. That is worship. And that was the problem with the church that Jesus had to deal with when he came. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand for what's right and what's wrong. But it does mean we do it tactfully and we do it with Christian love. Is that true? And I have to learn that too. Uh, there probably isn't a one of us at times who has not stepped over the line and being unkind and trying to help people because we want, we're standing for something we think is so important that it's more important than their feelings, it's more important than their life, it's more important than our gentleness and patience with them. And it destroys the church and it destroys our witness and so forth. 
So, let's get back to worship because it includes all of those things. All right, here we go. This was the church that Jesus dealt with in his day. Here's what he says, and I want you to listen to it very carefully. Woe to you teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Well, he wasn't exactly tactful in that particular statement, but uh, he was talking to the religious leaders that should have known better. And here's what he says. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. What is the motive, what is the attitude of those rulers based upon those texts? What's their attitude in religion and worship? There you go. And isn't that our issue? You know, if you're a great speaker and you give a great sermon and so forth, it's very easy to say, hey, not bad. Okay? If you have a great talent, whatever it might be, it's easy to take attention to yourself. There was a sitcom called, how much time we have? Oops, come on, Chuck, get moving. There's a sitcom that was called Little House in the... You did watch that, okay? Little House in the Prairie. And when my, uh, real quickly, a little background, is when my... Um, uh, we had devotions on Saturdays uh, afternoons and so forth uh, of Sabbath. Um, sometimes we, when we lived in Wisconsin, we lived in Iowa, um, there was situations where it was too cold to go outside. It was so cold. So we'd have our regular devotion. And then what, do you, what books do you think we read to the kids? later in the afternoon. Little House in the Big Woods. The Long, Long Winter. Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote those books at a early old age. Because of, the reason we read them, because the character building in those books was so good. It was outstanding. And the kids would say, Dad, read another chapter. Read another chapter. We read for four hours. We take about a half hour break, you know, a 10 minute break, and we go back at it. Read another chapter, read another chapter, and so forth. So the TV sitcom wasn't quite as good. If you've read the book, isn't that true of most stuff? If you've read the book, the other is not all that great, and so forth. But here's the deal. They had this little church in this little town, and of course, Laura Ingalls, you know, lived in a lot of places. She was in Wisconsin, she lived in Kansas, she lived in South Dakota, et cetera, et cetera. This particular issue or time was in South Dakota. And they went to church on Sunday, and uh, they needed a bell for their church. And so uh, anyway, this one couple, he was a storekeeper, and if you remember, if you've watched the TV program, and this is true in the book as well, uh, and his wife, who was very outspoken, and they said, we'll put the money on. We'll buy the bell. But make sure two things happen. Our name is on the bell, and there's a plaque in the foyer. It, it, I don't think there's any of us that don't want to perform. We, don't want to, we want to look good, do we not? It would be normal to do that. We want to always do our best if we can, and so forth. But here we see a religion that is based on those two things. Remember what the two things that are important. Two keys in order for true worship. Remember? What is it? Worship in the spirit and in truth. Let me ask you something. Are they worshiping in the spirit here? What motivates these people? Is it the Holy Spirit? Would the Holy Spirit motivate us to focus on outside things and leave the inside alone? Probably not. Let's try another one. Ooh, those are a little small print. I hope you can read that. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. To be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. What is the objective of people who want to show their righteousness? Well, we all do. I want to look righteous. You want to look righteous, right? But if that's your primary goal and objective to how you look, what does Jesus say about that? 
That's bad worship. Right? Again, it goes back to worshiping in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not lead us to basically proclaim our goodness. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you have attended a testimony service? One? Oh, come on. Really? Bob said, well, kind of. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's been a while. I'm glad you said that, and I'm glad, glad but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I can remember when I was dating my wife, and she was attending a church called the Evangelical United Brethren. You know that, Robert. You said that a million times. And it never was a time during the either midweek service or they'd usually have a Sunday night service or whatever that they did not have testimony time. Every time. And, you know, I felt very uncomfortable. I wasn't a Christian. I had a lot to say uh, and so forth. And um, people would get up and when they give the testimony. And some testimonies, what all they would talk about was Jesus. That's all they talk about. And then there were some testimonies that all they talked about was themselves. I was able to do this, and I was able to do that, and this, and this, and this, and this. Never heard Jesus in one word in their mouth. But in essence here is that false religion is a religion that focuses on me or on you. Would you agree with that? That is false religion. We may look as good as good. We may be, you know, Paul says, in the flesh, I was infallible. What he was saying, living with basically focusing on the outside, I was as good as it gets. But you know what he says later? That experience was nothing less than garbage. It was nothing. It was no good. Why? Because it never brought peace. He was always striking at himself. And when you look at yourself, you start judging others because you're better than they are. And you start looking about what they're doing and how they're doing it, and so forth. Jesus had no time for that, and so forth. So let's take the next one. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street corners. And then he uses the example about our hand. Do not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Help people and don't publicize it. Do you find it sometimes when you do something really good that you like to tell somebody? Huh? Come on. We've done it. Right? Sure. Oh, man. I, I got, so I, other people need to know the sacrifice that I've made. And so forth. I, I gave up on my wife doing that because she said that's no sacrifice. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. So, what is Jesus telling us here? Anything that glorifies us is false worship. We have nothing to say about us. We have everything to say about him, all right? Now, all the gifts he's given. Let's try another one. And when you pray, I love this one. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, stand in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by others. I left out the rest of it. You remember what the rest of it is? What does he say to do rather than that? Go into your closet, shut the doors, and worship your, the God, worship God in secret so that he may reward you openly. Now, why do you think that Jesus said, you know, the best part of prayer is a prayer that's secret, that's one-on-one. -on -one. Why is that the best form of prayer? It's kind of like a date. You take your wife out, you know, and we're dating and so on. Then we do what they call this uh, double date, where two's fine, three's a problem, right? Intimacy is a one-on-one -on -one experience. You agree with that? Real intimacy. And when you nail to talk to God, he wants the doors closed and nobody else listening. Because that's when you can be honest with him. Isn't that true? You can lay it out. There are many things we are ashamed to discuss. If, if we were to sit here today and I'm going to say, okay, everyone that's here, we're going to put on the screen everything you've ever done. 
uh, most of you probably leave, uh, and so forth. As we read in Steps to Christ, many times we will come before the throne of grace ashamed of our conduct. And so, prayer is a form of worship, is it not? But when we think about it, how is our private prayer the most important part of prayer? Yes, public prayer is important, but it does not, does not take the place of personal one-on-one -on -one prayer. Would you agree? And so forth. That changes everything. And uh, we could go into a lot of things about prayer. Some people, what do I have? I don't know what to say. Get a book. Get a notebook. Just write down the people who are hurting. How many people do you hear, I've got a problem with this, and I got you, you wouldn't get through about four hours of prayer to try to try to cover everybody. There's a lot of things we can pray about, and so forth. So, all right, let's go to the last one. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show they are fasting. What's the focus on? Worship that's focused on us is bad worship. In fact, it's not worship, except for ourselves. What is worship? What is worship? Worship is that it's a lifestyle. It's what we do every minute of every day is a form of worship. It displays where we are and where we're going and what we believe in and what we don't and so forth. That is worship. So, uh, I'm not going to have time to get to all of this because I wanted to get into the keys of worship. Uh, there we go. No, we don't. Let's try it again. Okay. We mentioned this two or three weeks ago. It's what we should never forget. In John 6, verses 28 and 29. Oh, Lord, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Oh, Lord. What can we do? What work can we do so that we can be like you? That we can do the works you want us to do? Two forms of works. And Jesus said to them, as he said in John chapter 17 in his prayer to his Father, he said, the work that you must do is to know the one whom the Father has sent. The Bible constantly uses the term belief. To trust, I passed it once a couple, three, four summers ago, again, mentioned the fact that trust is one of the key words, okay, in believing. And so Jesus said, your job is this, stay connected, right? Stay connected, stay attached to the vine. The branch feeds off the vine. The vine will give you the fruit, just like it does from an agricultural perspective, right? And so forth. So. Our work is to believe if we do it that way, we will worship in spirit and in truth. Because our focus isn't on me. Isn't that good news? That good news? The focus isn't on you. The focus is on him. And what's that? There was a song many years ago. I don't know if it was a hymn or not. It was called Jesus Did It All. Have you ever heard that hymn? I don't know if it was a hymn or a song. I mean, a regular song, maybe a popular song. Chitties did it all. You know, some people are offended by that. Oh, yeah, there's more to it than that. No, there isn't. There isn't more to it than that. Jesus did it all. That doesn't lead to disobedience. Jesus said, you know what? If you stay attached to me, if you just keep coming to me, you keep trusting me, you keep learning of me, you're praying, okay, and you're praying the way I've asked you to pray. You're seeking me in all issues and all troubles you might have and all the things you have. Bring it to me. And I'll tell you right now, because you're worshiping in the Spirit, you will bear fruit. And fruit is not just patience, goodness, kindness, and so forth. In fact, it's encapsulated by one word, love, right? Growing Christians are obedient Christians, but their attitudes are different. We don't use the fried chicken approach. Right? Okay, real quick. Uh, First Chronicles 16. We're not going to have time to that. Um, what time? Was, oh, how much time do we have? I need nine and we've got two. One. Okay, very quickly. When you get a chance, read First Chronicles chapter 16. It's part of your lesson this week. And the, the idea of this is that 
It was a worship service to celebrate the return of the ark to Jerusalem. Because believe it or not, without going into a lot of detail, the ark was taken in a battle with the Philistines, and it was taken to their capital. Well, they, uh, they spent about seven years with that ark. They said, enough of this. It was, it was destroying their idols and everything else. So they gave it back to the Israelites and gave them some extra money to take it. 27 years after it had been captured, we see 1 Chronicles 16. And in there, we'll see some keys to worship. And there may be just one we can key in. There's a lot of it. It says, a call to praise. We find that in 1 Chronicles 6, 8 through 13. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Now, why do we praise him? Make known among the nations what he's done for you. Right? What has he done for me? When we get up into a testimony service, I hope we start doing these again. And we stand up, and we stand up not because we're so great, but because we have seen in our life every day. Do you ever pray for a meeting you've got at 9 o'clock? These meetings have been tough at times. Lord, I need your help. I need your wisdom. The wisdom of Solomon. I need your help. You go to that meeting, and wow, many times what's happened? What my worst fears didn't happen. Remember that, right? And we start doing that every day. Pray about everything you know of that's going on in your life. Pray for people, all of that type of thing. You'll have something to confess. You will see Jesus in your life moving. You will see him doing things for you. And you want to share what Jesus has done for you in those areas. Right? So that's one of the keys to worship is praise because we're praising what? Not what God has done for Robert or for Dan. I'm praising God for what he's done for me because I personally experienced it. Make sense? All right. Well, I hope we got something out of uh, what is worship today. Real God. Maybe we can do this together. What are the two main points of worship? Number one. Right. The Spirit. Worship in Spirit. That means you have the Holy Spirit within you because you received it at, at conversion. And what's number two? To worship in truth. Every word that comes out of the word of God becomes part of us, becomes part of our lifestyle because of the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and for his love. We do give thanks for your goodness to us. We're not real good at worship, but we have a better understanding. We know that you supply the power, you supply the love, you supply the goodness. And we become your instrument, your tool that we can share that with other people, which we know the world would be attracted if we practice true worship. And we give thanks again for it. Thank you for your grace. Thanks for the opportunity that we can come to the throne of grace. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Thank you.